Let's open our Bibles this morning to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Looking at the fifth verse. I don't know if you do this, but I, 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 I save many of my calendars. I think I have, I have my calendars in my, in my desk that goes back maybe to year 2000. And you know, every so often I, I take them out and I just sort of page through them and it, it brings back memories. It brings me back to different things, different exciting moments, different places of ministry. And there is a nostalgia in that, you know, when you go back over those old calendars and you review them and you look at them. Um, but I, I think what the greatest and, and, and most exciting part is when you get a brand new calendar. Uh, I, I have a desk and I get, every year I get a brand new desk calendar. And, and I open it up, there's not a mark on it, there's not a blemish on it, there's not a note on it, there's not a little scribble on it. It is brand spanking new. And that's where you and I are today. We are starting fresh. We are starting over. In a few hours, 2018 will be here. This is what Revelation 21, 5 says to us. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Can you give the Lord a clap offering for that? I make all things new. And we are at the threshold of a new year. The beginning of starting over and how exciting that is. I believe God enjoys the new. We live in the day of the new covenant where both Peter and John were used in the, in the spirit as they speak to the church and they speak to you and I that one day God will create a new heaven and a new earth. Can you say amen? And better than that, he's going to recreate us. And we are going to have a new body. Can you say amen? amen? Now, that might not get some of you excited, but I've always wanted to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger. So I'm looking forward to that. Now, i got some news for you. In heaven, it's going to be perfection. All of us are going to be perfect. Now, in your own mind, you can just think about what, what is perfection to you? Now, you know, um, I think first of all, I just want to give you a little heads up on this. In heaven... Well, put it, let, me put it, let me put it this way. God made a few perfect heads, the rest he covered with hair. So in heaven, we might all be bald. <laughs> but what, what do you think heaven is going to be like? That perfection. Imagine a place of no sickness, no disease. No pain. No heartache. No fear. No depression. No loneliness. No longings. Our God is the God of new. I will make all things new. And you and I will have a glorified body. We'll have a body that uh, it's, it goes far beyond our human imagination. Think about it. Brand new. Not a mark of sin. Not a mark of sin. No, no, no feeling bad about yesterday or, or the past. No, no, no baggage that we'll be taking with us. It's all. All will be gone. And we'll be in that place called heaven, the new Jerusalem, streets of gold, a place of eternal light, eternal peace, eternal joy. We'll be there in front of the throne of God, worshiping with the holy angels. Can you say amen, church? In fact, give the Lord a clap offering. That's our hope. Hallelujah. That's what we're waiting for. That's what we're longing for in our hearts and in our spirits. But what about now? What about now? Listen, there's good news for you and I right now as we begin this year of 2018. What a tremendous passage of Scripture is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. This is what it says. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Church, can you give, give the Lord an amen on that? All things became new when you and I came into that relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean that when you're born again, all your circumstances change and you have 20000 in your bank account and you have a nice car out in the, in, in the front? No, it, it has nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with that. When you're born again, you know, uh, people you know, think that all of a sudden everything's going to come up roses. No, it's, that, that's not the case. 
Certainly not. But it means, what it does mean is that the person who is born again is changed. The person that is born again is changed. You will be changed. Your nature. Your nature. The nature, the propensity that we have towards sin. The, 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 the struggles that we have with our character and our nature, our anger, our fears, our jealousies. Those things will be changed. Our outlook, our outlook, you know, I, I got to say this, you know, <laughs> I've been around a lot of Christians in my 53 years in the ministry, 52 years in the ministry, excuse me, married 53 years, 52 years in the ministry, and I found a lot of Christians who have been baptized in pickle juice. Either say amen or ouch. You know what I mean. They never have a good word. They always find something to complain about. Always something to, to say, well, it was too hot, it was too cold, it was this, it was that. You know, you find that. But you know, when you come to Jesus Christ, He changes your outlook on life. He works within you to change you. He changes your perceptions. How you see life, how you see people, how you see the world that you're living in. How important that is. That that is incorporated into us. Our perception. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. We are victorious as we walk through this world. We are not beaten down. We are not destroyed. We are lifted up because we have the King of kings and the Lord of lords living and ruling and reigning in our hearts. Come on, give him praise in this house this morning. I know we live in a world that's full of negativity. And I've said this to you before. I'll say it again. You want to get depressed? Watch the news. Come on, give me an amen. Yeah, that's what it's all. You want to get depressed? Watch the news. We live in a very depressing world, but you and I are to be shining lights in that world, full of the joy and, 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 and the life of Jesus Christ, how important that is. And so our perceptions, our interests, our reactions becomes his, his interests, how important that is. Listen, if you've got one foot in the world and you're messing around with the world, it's going it, it's, it's to just drain you. That's the way it works. What is light to do with darkness? The word tells us to come out of this world and be separate. And what does that mean? It means that we should have the life of Jesus Christ shining out of our lives. Our words, our thoughts, our actions, the way we live. Everything about us should be different than the world that we're living in. It should demonstrate, it should show, and it should, it should give a, a picture of Jesus Christ that we have the King of kings and the Lord of lords ruling and reigning in our hearts. Come on, church. Give the Lord praise this morning. And so he, you and I have an opportunity a chance to start over. You know, I think all of us have thought about our 2018 New Year's resolutions. <laughs> we get a chance to make new ones. I still haven't accomplished the old ones, but I'll make some new ones. <laughs> Can you say amen? <laughs> a new creature in Jesus Christ. You see, Christianity is not in the reforming business. He is not in the reform. Jesus is in the recreating business. Jesus will come into your life and recreate you. He'll make you into someone that you wasn't before. You see, that's the purpose. I, I, I think I told that story here, but I'll tell it again because it's a good story. A young man got saved, wonderfully saved. He was in the world. He did, did a lot of worldly things and so forth. But he got, he got saved. And he began to look to the Lord. He began to wait upon the Lord and read the Bible. In the course of doing that, God began to talk with him and deal with him. And he felt so impressed that he should become a missionary. And so he, he asked, he said, how do you become a missionary? And say, so someone told him, well, you've got to write a letter to a missions board. And if they accept you, they'll support you and send you out on the mission field. And so he did that. He sent out about a, a dozen letters. Well, he had no background, no training, no, no, no Bible college, no nothing. So sure enough, he got letters back saying, thank you, but we, we, can't, we can't use you. But he was a tenacious young man. And so he went back to pray. He said, God, I really feel that you want me to do something in missions. And so God sort of spoke to him again. He said, said, write another letter and tell those people what you can do. Now, he was really gifted with his hands. He was one of those guys that could do electrical work, masonry work, plumbing work, carpentry work, anything that needed to be done. He had that skill and that ability in his hands. And so he wrote letters again, and sure enough, he got an invitation for an interview. 
He went to the interview, met with the people there, and they talked with him. And finally, the, the, the man that was in charge said, listen, he said, this is our situation. We have a mission station so far in the interior of this country, so far removed that we can only get supplies to them twice a year. If there's a problem or a difficulty, we have to literally fly a helicopter back there in order to help them. We need someone to go to that mission station, get it up and operational, and keep it running. Do you think you can do it? The young man said, I can do that. I, I can do that. So they sent him. And sure enough, within three months, the plumbing was working, the electrics were working. He had, he had remodeled different things, and, 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 and the mission station was just humming. Well, he would work on Monday through Friday at the station. On the weekends, he was off. So he found an old motorcycle. He got it working, and he would pack some food, and he would go into the bush, into the jungle, and, 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 and just explore around. There he found a group of people that had never been contacted by the missionaries. They had never been spoken to about Jesus. And he began to work with them. He would go there every weekend. He would spend the whole weekend there with them. He showed them how to plant crops. He showed them how to fish. He showed them how to do so many things better than what they were doing. And he did that for almost just about three years, two and a half, three years. And then he got sick. And very rapidly he died. It was about a year or so before the missionaries, they, they, they had heard that he had gone somewhere. We you know, said, well, let's see if we can find that village. And so they, they found that village. And the missionary cut a little road. They, they went into that, into that village. They set up their equipment. They turned on the generator. They began to sing. And, of course, all the people came. The chief came. The elders came. And there they were. And finally, after they sang a little bit, the missionary got up. And he began to talk to them about Jesus. And he began to tell them how wonderful Jesus was and what kind he was and gracious. And as he was telling them about Jesus, the people began to talk to each other, whispering to each other. And that was very uncommon in, in their culture. Finally, the chief stood up and said, Sir, sir, please forgive me to, to interrupt you, but we must tell you, we must, you must know this, that we know, we know Jesus. Jesus was here in our village. We know Jesus. Well, that took the missionary back a moment. And when they began to ask some questions, they found out that those people, those, th those natives, had mistaken that young man for Jesus. They thought he was Jesus. They mistook him for Jesus. You see, that's the working of the Holy Spirit in your life and in my life. That people will see Jesus in us and literally mistake you for Jesus. Can you say amen? Come on, give the Lord praise this morning. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. To change you. To make you, to mold you into the image of Jesus Christ. Not haphazardly, not randomly, but God has a definite plan. Everything that comes into your life, every day that you live, God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is working to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ, that people will see Jesus in you, they will see the glory of God in you, they will see the working of miracles in you, and give Him praise and give Him glory. Come on, church, give Him praise in this house this morning. You know, it's amazing about us Christians... We're funny ducks. You don't have to say amen to that. <laughs> but you know, I, I don't, you know, maybe you've noticed this. I, I have. It is not difficult for me to pray for other people. It's easy for me to pray for them. But when I have to pray for myself, all of a sudden, all my shortcomings and failures seem to pop up. Have you noticed that? You know, as soon as you go to pray for yourself, well, God, you know... Uh, all the little things that, that I shouldn't have done, I shouldn't have said, I shouldn't have thought, all begin to pop up. And we have a tendency then to back away. Well, I'm not worthy. I'm not holy enough. I'm not righteous enough. You know, I, 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 I'm not good enough for God really to bless me. You know, and the, and, and the devil loves that. That's what it says. He's the accuser of the brethren. He will accuse you like that. But you have to, you and I have to, and this is what I do. When I begin to feel that way, I, I go back to the cross. And I recognize that in the cross of Jesus Christ, what he did on that cross was what purchased my healing, my blessing, my peace, my joy. Everything that you and I receive through God comes to us through and by Jesus Christ. He is the reason. He is the reason that God blesses you and blesses me. 
If I were to walk into the presence of God and I would stand in front of him and I would try to pray, God would look down from his throne and he would say to the angels, hey, is, is, that, is that old Fogel? And they say, yes, Lord. And God would look at me because God knows everything about you. Can you say amen? Every word, every thought, every action. There's nothing hidden from God. You can hide, hide it from the wife, from the kids, from, from, from pastor. You can hide it from everyone, but you can't hide it. So he sees it all. He'd say to the, God would say to the angels, angels, throw old Fogel out. Because there's sin in his life. Because the Bible says all have, say it with me, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not one in this room that's righteous. And if you are, your righteousness is filthy rags. So the angels would come down off the throne of God and, and they would come and they would want to grab me and throw me out. But just at that moment, Jesus would stand up and Jesus would walk and stand in front of me. And Jesus would look at the Father and say, Father, treat old Fogel as you would treat me. That's what he does for you. That's what he does for you. That's what he does for you and for you. When, when you come into prayer, God doesn't look at your sins. He doesn't look at your past. He doesn't look at your failures. He doesn't look at your mistakes. He sees Jesus in you. And then Jesus says, Lord, treat him as you would treat me. Come on, church. Give him praise in his house this morning. You and I can, what do you, the Bible says, we, we come into the presence of God with boldness. How do you do that? I can't do that in myself. My righteousness is as filthy rags. But I can come with boldness by and through the merits of Jesus Christ, by and through the blood of Jesus Christ. I can come in and I can ask great and mighty things because I'm covered. You're covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Come on, give him praise. And that should destroy the timidity that we have to ask for great and mighty things. You're not blessed because of who you are or what you are of what you've done. I think I've said this to you before. I'll say it again. Never pray, oh God, give me what I deserve. If you do that, let me know. I want to put a few feet between me and you. We don't, we don't deserve anything. We're sinners saved by grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so you and I can come with holy boldness into the throne room of God and say, God, I need healing. I need, I, I need a touch of my body. I need a touch of my family and my finances, whatever the situation. The devil is going to say, you're not worthy. And you can agree with me. Yeah, I'm not worthy. I'm not coming on my own rights, my own merits. I'm coming on the rights and the merits of the blood. On the blood of Jesus Christ that we shed on Calvary. Hallelujah. That gives me a right to enter in with boldness. That's what happens. He changes us. We become new creatures in Jesus Christ. That's what God wants to do. That's what he's doing. That's what he's been doing in your life. The things you've been going through, the things that have happened to you, have all been there to make you become like Jesus. When something happens that, that you might not like, instead of just getting upset and, and getting down, say, Lord, I want you to use this to make me like yourself. You know, when you pray that prayer, you know what? God uses the devil to be a catalyst to make you better. Can you say amen? amen. Do you get that? When, when, you, when you have a test or a trial, when you have a situation and you're upset and, you, and you're, you, you, you might be really, really down about it, instead of just staying there, say, wait a minute, God, use this to make me more like you. When you and I do that, then God can use, this, use the enemy, use Satan. He becomes a pawn in the hand of God to make us like Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we become new creatures in Jesus Christ. Christianity is not a reforming business. It is a recreating business. Way back in the Old Testament, before the cross, before the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, God was in the recreating business. He finds a man by the name of Abraham. He was a very wealthy man. Somewhat elderly gentleman, about 75. I can identify with him. He lived in a city called Ur of the Chaldees. He, he, he was quite wealthy. But God had something bigger for Abraham to do than just to grow old gracefully. He called him. 
He called him out of his country and he sent him somewhere else to a country he was going to show him. And through and by Abraham, he would raise up a people that would bless the world. And through that people, the Lord Jesus Christ would come. And Abraham says yes to God. And in 75 years of age, he launches out into a new venture. He's not waiting around to die. He's not waiting around to, you know, to, 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 to go to the old folks' home. But he launches out to allow God to use him in a new dimension. No matter how old you might be here this morning, 2018 is a day, is a year where you can launch out into the greater things of God. Can you say amen, church? No matter how old you might be, you, no matter wh where, what part of life you might be in, God can still use you. God can still work through you. God can still have his Holy Spirit in your life that you'll make an impact in the world you're living in and you'll see great and mighty things. Come on, church. Give the Lord praise this morning. How amazing it is. That God can take an older person, 75 years of age, or a young person, fill them with his Holy Spirit, and make them a catalyst in the world that we're living in. There was another gentleman I want to draw your attention to. His name was, it was Jacob. He had the opportunity of a new beginning. Jacob was a little different than Abraham. Jacob, if, if Jacob lived today, if Jacob was alive today, because of his dirty dealings and shenanigans and, and, and crookedness, I was born and, raised, born and raised in Brooklyn, so this term comes to, comes to me very, very easily. If Jacob was alive today because of his character and his past, he would have ended up with concrete overshoes in the East River. All you New Yorkers know what I'm talking about. <laughs> or in Staten Island out in the sand dunes. <laughs> but he was a character. He was a shyster. He was a conniver. He was a thief. He was a liar. You read about his life. He goes from one thing to the next. Always, always play, play, playing to some sort of con. Always trying to get ahead. If you met him on the street and he said, good morning, you'd be sure there's a hurricane coming in the afternoon. If he waved at you, you'd wave back and you kept one hand on your wallet. I mean, that's the kind of guy he was. That's the, no one, no one appreciated Jacob. No one thought much of Jacob. No one had any respect for Jacob. But God gave Jacob a chance to turn things around, to start over. You know the story, he wrestles with the angel and so forth and so on. And God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. Jacob to Israel, and he became a giant in the work of God. In fact, the 12 tribes of Israel, those were his 12 sons. And, and, we, and this is where the nation of Israel came. And you could see, here is a man so low, so despised. But when he gave himself to God, how God changed his life so drastically that he's now looked upon Abraham Isaac and Jacob, you know, those names are synonymous. People know them all over the world. Let me give you another one. There's a guy by the name of Moses. How many remember Moses? He lived in, in Egypt. And miraculously, because there was a decree gone out from Pharaoh that all the boy, uh, Jewish male children should be killed, that, that his mother put him in a little bit of a, 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 a raft, and, and he was picked up by, by, by Pharaoh's sister, and he was raised in Pharaoh's household. He was raised for 40 years in Pharaoh's house. Then all of a sudden, he was let go, and he was sent packing. He left the, the corporate headquarters. He left the palace of the Pharaoh and he ends up watching sheep in the desert. Man, that's a fall, isn't it? From the top to the bottom. From being in Pharaoh's household, a part of Pharaoh's family, to watching sheep in the desert. Now he's 80 years old. No one would have predicted any great things from this man. No one would have said too much about him except God. 
God had a plan for Moses to start over. And for the next 40 years, he would turn the world upside down. You know the story. He takes the children of Israel out of Egypt, leads them to the promised land. God uses him in miracles and signs and wonders. And he was 80 years old when that all started. How, 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 how beyond comprehension that God could take a life that's been destroyed, that has no value, that's been in, 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 in the back of the desert. But when you give your life to Jesus Christ, he can take you, mold you, make you, and use you for the praise of his glory and to do great and mighty things to you. Come on, give him praise in his house. He can do that for you. <laughs> Let me interject this commercial just, just that you stay with me. Listen, I know some of you say, well, Pastor... That's, that's Moses, and that's, you know, uh, Abraham, and, you know, Pastor, you know, those are great men, you know. Pastor, they were tremendous men. That's true, they were. But let me tell you something. The Bible says God is no respecter of person. Turn to your name and say respecter. Respect. You know what that means? God does not respect Moses more than he does you. God does not respect Abraham more than he does you. We are all leveled at the cross of Jesus Christ. We're all on level footing. Hallelujah. And the blessings that he gave them, he'll give to you if you cry out for them and desire them and pray it through. Come on, church. Give the Lord a clap offering this morning. There are no rejects in the army of God. There are no castaways in the army of God. So at, he was a washout. But God gets a hold of him. And he turns the world upside down. Well, those are good guys. And let me speak to someone else. You know, you might think, well, Pastor, you don't know. My life has been a mess. I just messed up big time. I have so many things in my past. I don't even want to begin to talk about it. And good, you shouldn't. You know, there's just nothing God could do for me. I, I, I just really messed up big time. Well... You might have been told that. You might be living that way. You think everything is downhill for you from here on through. Or maybe it's been like that for years. Everything's been going downhill. And, and you've come to the place where you sort of believe it. Well, I can't do anything. I, I, you know, I, I just have too many, too many things in my life, too many past things, this past baggage. that It, it shows up. People know about it. People talk about it. People hear about it. They're all, when, when they look at me, they see those things. Can I, can, I, can I tell you a little story? Can I tell you a little story? There's a, a woman in the Bible by the name of Rahab. How many know Rahab? Some of you know Rahab. Well, Rahab was a lady of the night. She ran a brothel. She was a prostitute in Jericho. Everybody knew about it. She ran a house of ill repute. When her name would come up, people would, you know, roll their eyes. They would shirk their shoulders. They would say, hey, you know, whatever it was. Whatever it was. You know, when her name came up, when the people talked about her, there was, there was always smirks and knowing looks. But God had a plan for this woman of the night. And her life completely changed. Matthew tells us about it. She married a man who had been Israel's James Bond. You remember when the Jews got to the promised land, they sent spies out? Well, well, there was one of the spies. One of the spies. His name was Salman. Salman. That, he was one of the, the, those spies that was sent out. And he stayed in the house of Rahab because they were looking for them. They found out that the spies were in the city and they were trying to get them to kill them. And so he was there. And so here this, this man, he got to know Rahab. And, and you know the story that he, she let them out of, the, out, of, out of her house down, down on the basket. They escaped, so forth and so on. But she said, listen, if I do this, will you save me and my house? He said, yes, you'll be saved. Well, somehow, some way, a, a, a love relationship happened between this lady of the night this prostitute and this guy Salman. And from that relationship, there is born a son, and his name is Boaz. How many remember Boaz? He, he eventually married Ruth. Remember Ruth? And their offspring was David. David came from that, that, that line. And then who came from the line of David? Jesus. Jesus. Wait a minute. Jesus' great, 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 great grandmother was a prostitute. Woo! 
I wonder if they find that in ancestry DNA. <laughs> that, that, when you get that, they're like, hey, your, your great grandmother was a, yeah, I want a new one. Get, get me a new family tree. But she's part of Jesus' family tree. God used her. And through her, a baby was born that we just celebrated. The greatest of all, our Lord Jesus Christ, Rahab was a great ancestor of Jesus Christ. I know what some of you are saying. Well, Pastor, that's old stuff all the way. Well, let's look at some of the New Testament stuff real quick. This guy w- was an employee of Rome. Remember, the Romans came and, and they conquered the known world. They con- conquered Israel, Palestine. And, 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 and this guy lived in a nice house in Jericho. He, lived, he was very, very well-to-do. And he, he, he had a reason that he was so well-to-do. He had the money to buy this beautiful home. You see, he had legally stolen the money by and through the graces of Rome. You see, his name was Zacchaeus. And and, and he was a tax collector. And so he worked for Rome. And so when he collected taxes, he would say, two for Rome, one for me, two for Rome, one for me. He was a crook. Boy, that reminds me of something. How many of our, our, our people in Congress, when they go in poor, they come out rich? Oh, I tell you, it's amazing. It's been around for a long time. <laughs> well, that's what it was. If, if, if the people in the town could have gotten their hands on him, they would have killed him. But they, all, they were reminded so often of a Caesar's soldiers that were in the town. These guys with the long, sharp swords. And so that, that, that sort of deterred them. Now, Zacchaeus didn't have much of a future until Jesus came to Jericho. And that crooked little thief became the town's most prominent, law-abiding, respected citizen. He had a start over. That crooked man, that thief, that carn artist, when Jesus came and came to that town and touched his life, he became one of the most outstanding citizens of his community. Church, can you say amen? You see what God will do in your life? I don't care what your past is. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what's behind you. When you come to Jesus and you allow him to take control of your life, he too will change you and make you into what he wants you to be for the praise of his glory. Come on, church. Give him praise. What about Peter? Peter, a clumsy, weak, ineffective, vacillating, cowardly old fisherman. Remember when, when, when Jesus was crucified, Peter was on the, out, out, outside of the, the, the temple there. A little girl says, aren't you one of them? And, and this, 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 this blows my mind. He had spent three and a half years with Jesus. That's like going to Bible school. Spent three and a half years like going to Bible school. And he flunks. He curses. He cur- if you did that in Bible school, they'd kick you out. He curses. He says, I never knew him. And he walks away. He denies Jesus. Then you just flip ahead a few more pages and you come into the book of Acts. Once he's filled with the power of God, he preaches to thousands of people. He, God uses him to heal. God uses him to do supernatural things. He does miraculous things. This clumsy, this ineffective fisherman who, who, who failed so miserably when he came into the power of God, when Jesus Christ came into his life and filled him with the Holy Ghost, he became a dynamic force for the kingdom of God. And he can do that in your life. Turn to your neighbor and say, he can do it for you too. He can do it for you too. Come on, give him praise in his house. Hallelujah. It's time for the church of Jesus Christ to rise up and say, Lord, I want all that you have. I, I don't want to just muddle through this life. I want to walk in glory and victory by and through Jesus Christ. What about the Apostle Paul? Now, the, now if you really say, well, Pastor, huh? you, I'm really messed up. You don't know, man, I am the messed up of the messed up. You want to bet? The Apostle Paul, otherwise known as Saul, he was a murderer, a slaughterer of the church. He put Christians to death. He killed brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ and the Lord. I don't think any of us have done that. Where we've gone out and killed brothers and sisters in the Lord. That's who Saul was. You know the story. 
You know the story. On the road to Damascus, on the highway leading to the city, Paul meets Jesus Christ face to face, and he starts over. The past is eradicated. This is the man who is now saying, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away, and all things have become new. This is the man that's making that statement, not just theoretically. He had experienced it, church. Can you say amen? That's what God wants to do for each and every one of us. He'll take us out of the deep, the deepest uh, 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 of sin and degradation. He'll take you out wherever you might be and set your feet on the rock, Christ Jesus, and make your life worth living if you give it to him. Come on, church, give him praise this morning. Hallelujah. What a loser this man was. But God made him a champ. All those people lived thousands of years ago. Yes, they did. But I would venture to say there are untold people in this room that could stand to their feet and say, that's my story. When Jesus Christ came into my life, I changed. My attitude changed. My spirit changed. My vocabulary changed. This is what God offers to you and to me this morning. God offers to each and every one of us forgiveness. And, and, and we need that. We need the realization that the past has been eradicated. As far as God is concerned, a young fella would come before the Lord and pray. And then, and, and, and he would, you know, he would come down and he prayed and he said, Lord, I messed up. And he'd tell the Lord what he did. Next day he got down to pray again and he'd do the same thing. He said, Lord, I messed up. And he'd tell the Lord what he did and ask forgiveness. And after a while, one day he got down, he was just so frustrated. He said, Lord, he said, he said, I messed up. And he said, I did the same things I did yesterday. And God said, what did you do yesterday? What did you do yesterday? You see, God forgives and he forgets. God forgives and he forgets. God's forgiveness is there for you and I by confessing your sin to the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter how hard, no matter how bad, no matter how dreary, no matter how dark your past, your life has been. Those things will di disappear. They will dissolve as you cry out to the Lord for his mercy and, and for, for his, his kindness to be extended to you. That's what he does. That's why it's so great as we celebrate this new year. 2018 can be a year where you walk in forgiveness, where you walk in newness of life, where you walk in that hope, where you walk in that reality that my sins are forgiven. We ask that question. If you were to die right now, would you go to heaven? What a tremendous question that is. If you were to die right now, would you go to heaven? Do you have the assurance that your sins have been... If you don't, you can receive Jesus. You can ask for forgiveness this morning, and he'll forgive you of your sins. You'll know, you'll know without a shadow of a doubt that your sins are forgiven. You know, when you come for forgiveness to God, what you're really doing is, is agreeing with him about your sin, about your past. You're saying, yes, God, you're right. My sin is rotten. My sin is dirty. My sin is vile. I've been playing games. Oh, I go to church. I look good. I smell nice. But in my heart, in, 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 the, in the recesses of my being, there are things that I know that are displeasing to you. And Lord, I know that I'm not in right standing and I know that I don't have the power I should have because those things come back to haunt me. Please forgive me, Lord. I confess my sins to you at that moment. God, God's forgiveness God forgives everything in your life. He forgives your past and he never brings it up to you again. That's how great, that's how powerful this wonderful thing is. When we can start a new year say, Lord, Lord, I'm just giving it all to you. I'm not withholding anything. I'm just saying, Jesus, it's yours. Take it. It's yours. Take it. I'm not holding anything back. The hidden things, the secret things, the things no one else knows about. But you know about it, he knows about it. And it keeps you from being all that you can be. Mom took her daughter to the dollar store. And as they were checking out, little Jenny, her daughter, saw a set of pearls. And she said, Mommy, could I have those pearls? And her mother wasn't so quick to buy her everything. And she said, well, let's see how much they are. They were $3 and change. Not everything in the dollar store is a dollar, you know that. And so mommy said, well, let's see how much you got in your piggy bank, sweetie. When they got home, they opened up Jenny's piggy bank, and she had $2 or dollar some on change. And she said, well, you know, your birthday is coming, and grandma always gives you a dollar. 
And if you do some extra chores, I'll make up the difference and we'll get those pearls for you. And sure enough, within a day or two, she had those pearls. And that little girl, little Jenny, loved those pearls. Past Yvonne, she wore them everywhere. She wore them everywhere. Every nursery school, daycare, Sunday school, everywhere she was. Except she didn't wear them in the bathtub because it made her neck turn green. She loved those pearls. They were her pride and joy. It was the, it, it was the, it was the, the custom of the house for dad to read to his little girl and pray with her every night. And one night, after he had done reading the, the Bible story, he looked at her and said, Sweetheart, do you love your daddy? And she said, Yes, daddy, I love you. He said, Do you really love your daddy? Daddy, I love you. Then give me your pearls. Oh, daddy, not my pearls. Not my pearls. You can have any one of my dollies. You can have any one of my toys, but not my pearls, Daddy. And I said, okay, sweetie, that's all right. Come, let's pray. Next night, they came in. A few, a few nights later, came in once again, read the Bible story, and said, sweetie, do you love your Daddy? And she said, Daddy, you know I love you. Do you really love your Daddy? Daddy, I really love you. Then give me your pearls. No, 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 Daddy, not my pearls, not my pearls. You can have one of my horsies, one of my favorite horsies. You can have any one of them, Daddy. In fact, you can have two. But don't take my pearls. He said, that's okay, sweetie. You can keep your pearls. Let's pray. The next night when he came in, he found his little girl sitting on the bed. Legs were crossed. Tears streaming down her cheeks. He said, sweetheart, what's wrong? Is, are, are, are you okay? Are you feeling all right? She, she, just, she, she, she just sat there. And then finally she just reached out her little hand and said, daddy, these are for you. And when she opened her little hand, there was her pearls. Daddy, these are for you. And with that, her father reached out to take those pearls out of her little hand. He reached in his pocket, took out a black velvet box, hit the clasp, it opened up, and there he took out a genuine set of pearls. He was waiting for, her little, for his little girl to be willing to give up the dollar store stuff before he could give her the genuine stuff. God is waiting for you to give up the dollar stuff, the dollars, the stuff of this world, that he can give you the genuine stuff, that he can open the windows of heaven on your life. Listen, if you're tired of living the way you're living, then you need to come and say, Lord, take it all, all to Jesus, all the broken pieces, all the broken plans, everything, Lord, I give it to you. And let him come into your life. As you give him the broken pieces of your life, He'll give you the pearl of great price, the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll open the windows of heaven. Bow your heads with me.